1015 FM, 720 AM. Don, the talk of Las Vegas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the number one professional wrestling radio show in Las Vegas. This is the Mark Hoke Show. The Mark Hoke Show. One full hour of wrestling news, entertainment, and lots of Sin City surprises from inside the squared circle. Now, let's bring on the tag team of Andrew Fish Fame. Joe DeFalco, and your host, Mark Hoke. Oh, baby, it's time for some shenanigans. Tom Foolery, Tom Foolery, Tom Tom Foolery, Foolery too. Let's throw it in. There you go. Got to have both shenanigans and Tom Foolery. But hijinks are very important. Yes, they are. If you don't have hijinks, you got nothing. And then you got to throw in a 23 skidoo if we're going to talk about like 1930s, 1940s language. Yikes. We're fired up. That's the way it goes here on the Mark Hope Show. Thanks for joining us. We are live here on 101.5 FM, 7.20 AM. So whatever dial you got, we got you covered. I'm Mark Hoke. Thanks for being with us. This crazy SOB over here, Andrew Fish Fiend. I'm going to tell Jacob Fowl, too, what you said. Please do. No, you'll get hurt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and on the phone, we have the man, the myth, the legend. Well, it wasn't I wasn't done introducing you yet. I know, but his intro is more important than mine because he is the master of all wrestling here in Las Vegas. Well, he is. Yeah, he, he is correct. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not debating that at all. Joe DeFalco from Future Stars of Wrestling coming off a great night on Friday <sighs> with Mecca 7. Really enjoyed that show. A lot of fun, and we will talk about that later on, of course. <sighs> Because you know maybe there's going to be it's going to be a nice little timeline point in wrestling history for a certain uh, certain power couple. Wow, I'm I, I it was fun. Wow, it was fun. We'll, yeah, we'll get to talk about that. But I can't Joe, wait. Joe, how are you doing? You recovered? Uh, a little bit. I was really tired yesterday. I was like, man, I was I kept falling asleep on the couch. <laughs> I don't blame you, man. It was a packed house over there at the Silver Nugget for that event. So. Yeah, it was great to be back there, you know. It's uh you know, everything was put together there in a few weeks, so you know, we have to work on some you know, some things to, to add to the ambiance of that room. But it's a nice big room and uh, you know, having five hundred people in there, there's still room for another three, four hundred. So that you know, that's our future goal to get it to be a packed house to where there's no room. There was definitely some standing room only people, and it, it it was just a fantastic. The whole thing put together was was done fantastically. Absolutely. So we'll we will talk Mecca and everything that happened there a little later on the show. We got ninety minutes, by the way. I know Fish unfortunately was going to be here, but he's got to bail out after the first hour, so it'll be Joe and I finishing it out. Well, no different than every other time. So. Exactly. But. Uh, it, the, 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 I guess where we should start is in the most obvious place that the WWE has decided to go, which, which is uh, they're going to Saudi Arabia, so that means Goldberg has to make an appearance. Oh, I was getting there, but okay, we'll start there. So well, elimination. I'm hoping if if we're lucky, they'll just move the headquarters there, and we don't even have to watch it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vince should be moving that thing down to Florida after the the P and L statements came out. Well, we're going we're to talk about that, too. We've got a lot of WWE news. Of course, some fun happenings in AEW as well. MJF. Yes, a few of our people got uh, made some debuts this past week. Oh, that's on, right. Yeah. Uh, AEW Dark. Yeah, we'll get to talk about that, too. So I want to, but I, well, let's start with the Elimination Chamber. Oh, Which is what? In two weeks? Less than two, two weeks Two weeks now. away. Yeah, less than two weeks. Well, two weeks away okay. and some interesting. Uh, shall we say insertions into? The <laughs> well, uh, can, we, can you say it on the air? I just did. <laughs> I'd rather talk about Shane McMahon. Uh, that was good. Okay, we we I can leave. start there. Well, Absolutely. Well, well, I already started Elimination Chamber. But, but so we'll get to that. He, he brought up Shane O'Mac. Let's start Shane, with Shane O'Mac. Okay, well, that's where I was going to start before okay. you. Uh, so, so my qu- my question is: Well, let's let's tell everybody what happened first. He was fired. Was, what a bizarre situation. So apparently, Shane was. Wearing out his welcome in WWE land. Of course, Shane is the son 
of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. But he had, I mean, he, other, before Royal Rumble, he hadn't been back in a while. So, how, I mean, he must have worn out his welcome pretty quickly. Well, apparently there was some stuff going on before the whole Royal Rumble set up. And then Shane kind of stepped in and started taking charge of the Royal Rumble men's well, match. Well, yeah, I guess they made him and, a producer of the, of, of the match also. And I yeah. guess he had some crazy ideas. Yeah, he booked himself in the final four. Yes, he did. Oh, and well, that, that's no shock. You know, every time he's come in, he's gotten put over as, like, this, you know, monster guy. Like, he should have been the champion by now. He's the only man to not win a championship, by the way. Did, didn't he win World's Greatest Wrestler? Uh, it, it, don't even get me started on that fiasco. So, Shane, of course, apparently was butting heads with Vince about what to do in the Rumble. They were changing it constantly ticked everybody off and Shane was also talking about for WrestleMania get this to take on either WWE current champion Bobby Lashley Shane McMahon 52 years old taking on Bobby Lashley they also were considering him against Austin Theory See that would have made sense. See, and that right. made Other sense because would... Dad's the mentor. Exactly. That I, I have to, see that that match actually I would have bought and said, okay, I can see how they're setting this up. Yeah, you know that would that would have been a great spot for Austin Theory to get into. It was kind of like when they did the uh, the Umaga and Lashley with with McMahon and and Trump. You know, it yeah. it put a lot of eyes on you know Umaga at the time. Just like this would have put a lot of. Wondering, like, you know, okay, what's this Austin Theory thing going on with Vince McMahon? But to wrestle the jealous son would have been perfect. Yeah, I, because that I, don't, right, that I don't see where else the story can go. That's the perfect avenue for that story to that, take. That I could have could have swallowed. And Seth Rollins. No. <laughs> That, that 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 see that helps nobody. Fish banging the table. I mean, yes. But that helps nobody. No. It's, Shane McMahon it's ridiculous. Seth Rollins doesn't help anybody. It's ridiculous. And now I don't know who's I because I know that at one point they had Riddle originally booked to win the Royal Rumble. I don't know if that was still Vinnie Mac's idea or if that was Shano who changed it to Brock Lesnar or if they decide all decided it was going to be Brock. Well, Lesnar. I, I think the Brock Lesnar thing. Well, well, the funny part was is that you know Joe and I were you know had said you know, a while back you know that that should be the way it goes, right? Because of what happened with Roman Reigns getting COVID and shifted everything around. So you get the belt off Lesnar and let him win the Rumble, and then he takes the WrestleMania spot. But my, to, my, to point was, Roman Reigns. my point was he didn't ha- that didn't have to happen because you could have had whoever won the Rumble taking on Lashley, which would have left Reigns available at the at the re- at WrestleMania, and Brock Lesnar challenges him. He doesn't need to win the Rumble to be able to get the challenge against Roman Reigns. Uh, it it's a mess, and and they were still deciding up until uh, you know close to the match time who's going to win this thing, and and my you know my question to to everybody and is. Why is WWE when you're you're supposed to be setting this up a lot of this stuff all year long, right? They're talking about doing title versus title. They're not sure if they're going to do that. The whole thing was supposed to be about where's Paul Heyman going to end up. That's where it was supposed to go. It wasn't supposed to be about any of the championships. It, the championship was a sidelight to so it was a battle who for battling wins for Paul Heyman. Heyman, and they totally have forgotten about that. And now this thing is just turning into a Cluster F. Yeah, that's the word that I was going to use. Now, Joe, you you book, you plan stories out. What do you think about all this, that they are just shifting stuff on the fly constantly right now, so close to WrestleMania? Well, yeah, you know, the, the thing is, supposedly everything works backwards, so, you know, they should have known exactly where things were going, and then... You know, they did that title change when when Reigns got the COVID and switched in Lesnar, which, again, if the guy's going to be back in a week, I don't understand why they felt, you know, the need to do it to, to, you know, produce that that storyline because, you know, everybody was engaged. That was one of the few storylines they were engaged with. It's like, where was Heyman going to end up? And it was this whole Lesnar-Reigns thing, and everybody expected at WrestleMania – but in turn, it was like they put the belt on Lesnar, and I guess they felt, you know, gave, giving Lashley the win after being pinned for 45 seconds without a referee was going to make him strong. And in, and in the WWE world, nobody remembers. All they know is Bobby Lashley beat Brock Lesnar. But it seems like they did a lot of 
twisting and turning to get to the same exact spot they did right. that well, they planned on being in. And, well, the, the, the one thing in, in their defense I do want to say is their issue was – you got to remember last summer, or maybe it was the summer before, Roman Reigns, when, when COVID first came out, Roman stopped wrestling without even having it because, and, and he didn't wrestle for four months because he because of the leukemia, he was afraid of getting it. So when he first contracted it this time, they weren't sure how long he was going to be out for. They thought it could have been ap, ap, up to months that he was going to be out. Turns out it was just a week. I don't think they knew it was only going to be a week that he was going to miss. Oh, that's a decent yeah. point. That's a decent point. But, but this is now... You 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 would think that they had this at the place that they wanted to be. Oh, absolutely. Well, now the elimination chamber match, Bobby Lashley's going to be defending the title in Saudi Arabia against Seth Rollins, Austin Theory, Riddle, AJ Styles. This is a six man thing. Where well, I, and a, I still don't know why, they, got Austin, why they had Austin Theory beat Kevin Owens in that I match on Monday. I don't know either. But the sixth person is Brock Lesnar. Which, so he, now you've got a situation where either Lesnar's going to lose when you're trying to make him look strong, or he's going to win the WWE Championship. And it's going to be back to title versus and title, and where they were, were to begin with. back to where they were. So what, is, what are they doing? What are they yeah, doing? It, it is definitely weird, because in the Elimination Chamber, somebody has to be pinned. Yes. And I'm pretty certain you're going to have to... You know, I don't know what the odds are yet on Bet Online, but you, you would have to think: How are they going to pin? You know, either Lashley or Lesnar. Lesnar. Yeah, right. You know, I you know, they can pin Lashley, I guess, but there's no way Lesnar is going to be pinned. If he is, a it, it's not like oh, okay, cool. They they they're letting Lashley go over clean, but it's like why would they want to? When they're setting up, the, you know, the biggest match. Obviously, you can't use the Roman Reigns is going to cost Lesnar the match because they just did it. So, yeah, I thought that was extremely weird that they added him to the match. And you know, and the point is, if Lesnar actually does win, wow, you really missed an opportunity to give somebody the rub by having them win the Royal Rumble. Exactly. And, and now, absolutely. Is... But it, it, now, my question for you is when, because, and, and Mark just brought this up, when you are booking something, how, I mean, obviously things can change if there's an injury or something like that, but how far in advance are you generally booking a storyline? Well, when we do a show, we like, we do a similar show. It's called Against All Odds. We do a 30 man rumble. And we already have in place, you know, we knew Chris Bay was going to win the rumble. Okay, what we did one year was, uh, at the time, uh, one of our top baby faces, Shogun, who was getting a big push, uh, he won the Rumble. And we weren't going to have Shogun wrestle in the main event. So what we did was, uh, it was going to be Chris Bay who wrestled the winner of the Rumble. Shogun was, was the hot guy. Shogun ends up winning. He's getting ready for his match, and as he gets introduced, he gets laid out by uh, Hammerstone's faction, which was led by, well, by him and Graves. And, you know, being the stand-up baby face he is, even though we laid out Shogun, uh, Chris Bay was man enough to defend the title against Graves, and then because of interference, that's how we had the heel win the title from the baby face. And it also made us set up that now Shogun needed to get his revenge on Hammerstone and Graves, because at the time they were also the tag team champions. So Shogun then produced Kenny King as his partner, and that was the big moment for Shogun. And it was the plan all along to go there. And, you know, to do what they're doing, again, how many times do we come on here and be like, man, what is WWE doing? Which makes you think they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, no, no, because obviously they're also setting up. There's no way that Goldberg can beat Roman Reigns in this match in Saudi Arabia. So it's like, why even bother having that match? Because you're going to make Goldberg look weak again. Because you're getting rid of Goldberg. This is his last match on the contract. Oh, is it? And they like him over there. Oh, I mean, so, yeah. I mean, that's part. I know part they, of the deal in Saudi Arabia is they want only the biggest stars to wrestle in Saudi Arabia. That's why Goldberg's always there. I, yeah, so. I, I want to see Bret Hart against Shawn Michaels one last time, kind of like you know Leonard Duran, kind of like Rocky and uh, you know Apollo Creed. Jeez. <laughs> they, they both show up in wheelchairs. Oh. <laughs> it's a wheelchair match. Michael, they're, they're both doing okay. Yeah, I know. Shawn's but, looking pretty but good, they're, but they're so. old. <laughs> By the way, to to. Joe mentioned the betting odds real fast where it's at right now. Brock Lesnar is plus 100. 
Bobby Lashley is plus 150. Seth Rollins at 250. AJ Styles is at 600. Riddle 700. And you want to Austin Theory pull, pull a little Austin Theory money down? Plus 2,500 for you. Better than Summer Ray. He should, so. should be by plus 100,000. But I mean, at that point, you might as well take Lashley at plus 150 because you. Ugh. Because there's no point because you're, you're right. There's no point in him winning the title at the Rumble and losing it two weeks later or three weeks later at, at the Elimination Chamber. Yeah, but well, Lesnar, you know, if you had a match to where we could do, like we said, with you know a DQ, a count out, whatever it is, then yeah. But from what I'm aware of, there's no other way to lose in the chamber other than being pinned or submitted. Pinned. Yeah. Well, maybe that door is going to open somehow. <laughs> Speaking maybe, of the door opening, maybe side. that door is going to open up and some. Maybe the door is going to open and uh, out comes Chris Jericho and the inner circle. <laughs> and and then Ray is going to turn on her. Dominic's going to turn Stop on it. Ray. And, and, and then Eva Marie. Marie is going to come down. No! <laughs> no! It's a running joke, kids. Oh, <laughs> Lord. But it, as you can see, this whole picture of what's going on is a mess. It's just a booking mess. And speaking of booking messes, we were talking about Shane McMahon, who is now gone from World Wrestling Entertainment because of some past behavior and how he handled the Rumble and how he was work treating other people and you know per wrestlers. The wrestlers are all upset right now. They're, uh, there's a story that came out that said that their morale is at all time low. But Shane McMahon is out of WWE because of this. And the question is, guys, is is this you know squarely because of the stuff Shane did, or is Shane getting scapegoated for how bad that Rumble match was? Um, it's, well, if he booked it, he's 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 as much to blame as anything else. Then, well, but but part of it to me is when when you looked at that match, you really you had AJ Styles lead it off, and then you had about twenty guys that had no shot of winning this that they've booked throughout the years here. As mid-level, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, blah, blah, blah. And it, it left the Rumble without um, having any impact for two-thirds of the match. So, you know, that bad booking that leads into it is part of what hurt that Rumble, too, if you think about it. You know, that's, that's stuff that the creative team didn't build some of these guys up and left a massive hole in that match. You know, just because of what they've been doing and how they've been, you know, we're going to push this guy for a minute and then we're going to beat him down. And it's just, you know, and they did it to everybody. So now everybody looks like, eh. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, Shane, Shane's going to take, obviously take a hit on this, but is it totally his fault? Joe, what do you think about that? No, no, it's definitely not totally his fault. But again, he has been given carte blanche and every feud he's in, the part-time wrestler, you know, goes toe to toe and hits all the super cool stuff. And whether it's Owens or even before that, you know, when he wrestled Angle all the way through, like he is super Shano, you know, everybody knows it. It's like a running joke about he comes in and, you know, he's the only guy that is able to withstand, you know, the monster that's in front of him. And, you know, you always shake your head. And again, yeah, I give him credit. You know, he goes out there, he he busts his ass, and he does good stuff. But it it just seems like he always gets put in a position. As I was watching the Rumble, I'm like, yeah, of course Shane O'Mac's in the final four or five. You know what I mean? It's like he has to – he seems to really enjoy that spotlight. And guys who've worked hard for a really long time, as we're watching, and all of a sudden AJ Styles gets tossed, like – Nobody really figures Shane McMahon's going to win. If AJ Styles is in the final four, at least you have the anticipation, which it didn't matter anyway because Lesnar threw everybody out in five seconds, so there wasn't even like an excitement of the final four. So, you know, if he made these pitches and he acted the way he did, you know, it, it seems like Nick Khan is kind of more in charge of what's going on in, in the day-to-day than, than Vince. So, you know, and I know they've had their ups and downs, but, you know, to fire your own kid, oof, you know, 
<laughs> I want to fire my kid all the time, and, and I still don't pull the trigger, you know? No, and and it, you're right. It's got to mean something. I mean, just perfect example. You were talking about how Shado books himself strong. He when he, he booked himself in a program with Braun Strowman that he had absolutely no business being that, in a program with. That was a terrible program. That was terrible. I mean, just on, on the surface of it, when you're trying to picture, okay, I've got Shane McMahon taking on the giant Braun Strowman, and you know, your whole idea is, well, Strowman's stupid. Strowman's stupid. I can beat I can beat him because he's stupid. No, he's gonna kill you. Yeah, and it, it, it was, the whole thing was ridiculous. <laughs> it, it was it was terrible. But that's that, that's Shane McMahon's booking. It's because he sits there and goes, "I'm willing to take the jump off the top of the cage and go through a table. I'm willing to do the coast to coast and, and jump from the rope all the way across the ring. So I should take whatever uh, whatever spotlight I want to take." And and the and then the problem that that, that you know there's more fallout to this too because right now I like said. There's reports coming out that the that the wrestlers are just with everything going on. This Shane McMahon and the the rum, both Rumble matches were the kind of the last straw, right? Unmitigated now. They're, disasters. They're yeah. upset and they're frustrated. They're tired of seeing part timers come in and take their spots. They're, I think they're they, seeing the bad storylines. They're seeing how they're all getting booked, and it's driving them nuts. I think they also have an issue with Nick Khan because he's not a wrestling guy at all. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some issues there, but you know we're, we're going to talk well, a little bit about the you know the WWE's well, the good, the income. Good news is Happy Corbin is still happy. Yes. Yeah, and, and Mad Cat Moss is still Mad Cat. Yes, he is. Yes, but uh, you know even you know there's even fallout with um, Tyson Kidd, who's does producing, uh, has been doing it for a long time. He's of course married to Natalia. He well, they can't they can't get rid of him. He broke his neck on their watch, so he's got a job for life. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but he's upset right now. And he usually he stepped away from doing the rumble matches and didn't do the women's match, which he usually does. And some women actually said, "I don't want to be in the rumble if he's not producing it." And it, it's it's just a nightmare back there. You know, WWE. It seems they've they've got the world part right, they've got the entertainment part right, but they're forgetting about that other W in the middle, and that's wrestling. They're forgetting it. And, it, yeah, and it's I sad it to see for a long time. They've they've tried to they've tried to eliminate that part of it. And I also think it's because they think they're bigger than that. They're like, we're the WWE. It doesn't matter. We're going to make money hand over fist, no matter what happens. We're a, they're they're a TV show. They're not a wrestling company, right? You know, yeah, and and people, you know, and then they wonder why people are starting to go to AEW. And why I don't think they're wondering say- that at all because again, AEW is 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 more. Shown towards the wrestling fan, but WWE is more shown to just the average I'm watching TV fan. And if you watch the day to day and the Raw and the SmackDown, you see they're still catering and pandering toward you know the Vince McMahon and his poopy humor. You know, what I mean? <laughs> like, like, like they're trying to make the six year old laugh. You know, and it's like they gear it toward the kids in that situation. So and the, the cheesy but they want to make Vince happy, and you know, like even with Cena when. You know, you don't take things seriously because, you know, he feels and there's a, a thousand rewrites. And, you know, I remember when I was talking with uh, one of one of the producers at WWE and I was jokingly like, hey, bro, why don't you get me in, man? Get me a job in creative. He's like, dude, that's not the job you want. That's the worst job in that place. That's what everybody says because they just get vetoed all the time. And, and things yeah, change, and then they change get fired constantly. Before they even, you know, they uprooted and moved. You know, we thought it was bad for Alice in Danger, who went down for three months and uprooted her family to be signed on as a trainer for the women to get released three months later. Yep. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the business side of it when we come back. We're headed to break. Of course, they made some, brought in some money, did WWE. We're going to talk about that. When we come back, plus all sorts of stuff with AEW and uh, so much more on The Mark Hoke Show. Of course, don't forget to follow us on Facebook at The Mark Hoke Show, on Twitter at Mark Hoke Show. Of course, you got Fish, The Fish 1969, and Joe DeFalco at Futures FSW Vegas on Twitter. Of course, he's got that great website, too. So stick around, everybody. We will be right back on The Mark Hoke Show, the best in pro wrestling. More to come on KDWN. We'll be right back.
1015 FM, 720 AM. Don, the talk of Las Vegas. Now, let's return to The Mark Hoke Show. The Mark Hoke Show. Here again, your host, Mark Hoke. Ah, yeah. Here we are. Pro Wrestling News and Entertainment. Best in Vegas. Best on the planet. Screw it. We're the best. Mark Hoke, Andrew Fishfane, Joe DeFalco, hanging around. And, uh, hey, boys, the WWE took in some coin. Did you guys see this? Yeah, never a shocker. They know how to make deals. I'll tell you what. It, it, these reports were interesting. They they had they gave their reports for uh, 2021 to their stockholders. WWE pulled in uh, 1.095 billion dollars in revenue. Well, of course, that's why they got rid of all of those guys. They saved 180 thousand a year on you know 12 different guys. So. And that's why they're having the match in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. That's part of the money they brought in. The, right, they didn't, they didn't say that. Of the 1.08 billion, you know, 800 million of it came from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and a lot of deals. Uh, the the actual net income, by the way, ended up at 180 million. So they. That was their profit uh, after depreciation there you expenses. Go. They and didn't get rid of everybody. It would only been one hundred and seventy-four million. How was he going to live without that extra six? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you know, one thing that struck me on this is, you know, and and Joe, from you running a promotion, you know, you would probably have a little better idea. When I saw that bottom line profit number of one eighty, now, if I'm running a company, me, and I'm making one hundred and eighty million dollars. I'm I'm going to smile. I mean like thank you for taking that check to the bank. But but Joe is that is that a good number for WWE with all expenses and everything having pulled in over a you know nearly 1.1 billion dollars. Do you think that that that's a good profit number? That's a phenomenal profit number. AEW probably wishes they could have made 1 million in profit for the year. You know, it's like it's taken building a company for 60, 70 years. AEW's got to get the sponsors. They got to get, you know, just looking at the deals they signed, it doesn't matter than anymore that WWE doesn't do house shows. You know, that used to be the bread and butter of how they made money. You know, the pay-per-views were the, was the gravy. And now all they had to do is send content. You know, they're getting paid for a minor league company in NXT on USA. They're getting paid to air, you know, 205 Live that literally nobody watches. And they've gotten, you know, record-breaking numbers to be on Fox on SmackDown, despite the fact that when they do have live events and their ratings – which, you know, they're kind of skewed now because people watch on different platforms and everything. But if you look at everything, you would say, how are they making $180 million now when they were never making that before when wrestling was, was huge and wrestling was popular? But they've gotten to where when they run a WrestleMania, it's an event that everybody can't miss, and they'll do 60, 70, 80,000 people depending on how big the stadium is. So they just focus on the few events they have, the TV. Saudi Arabia gives them hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, if they just ran Saudi Arabia and did nothing the entire year, they'd still make 100 times more money than AEW. Fish? I I got nothing to say. I think he's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, you you, you say it like that it's a bad thing to make that kind of profit. Remember, that's pure profit. That's after paying all the paying all your performers, after paying for travel, after paying for everything. You're you're taking that money in and you don't owe anybody else. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So if if you took out the zeros and I made one hundred and eighty thousand running FSW, I would be ecstatic. Okay, fair enough. You know, I've the, the one thing that. You know, when I think back on where, for example, the TV ratings were, you know, the the peak Raw show did, you know, 9 million, 9 million people. That's what was during Attitude Era? Yeah. And now Raw is doing 1.7 and SmackDown's doing 2.2. And I just wonder if they were putting out a better product, 
and drawing, you know, double the ratings. It, it, or even, you know, a, a million more on but either side. But they don't side. need to. Well, and that's the thing. They they don't need to because they're making all these other deals. So it's it almost seems like they, you know, I, you know, I said they got they're forgetting the one W. They don't care anymore. They don't because well, how many how many people are watching? Do we get a number? How many people watched on Peacock during the week after it aired on on live? You know, is, is it a few million? We don't know. Is you know how many people go on YouTube? And how many views are there for the main event segment or the opening promo segment? You know, if I'm watching it live, believe me, I'm not going on YouTube to rewatch any segments, especially as crappy as it is to begin (laughs) with. Why would I watch it a second time? So those are, you know, those are brand new views of people who haven't seen it. So if you add it all up, see, everything's a manipulation of numbers. The ratings are a manipulation. When we had our show on CW at 12 o'clock in the morning, you know, we would have a rating of 1.2. The next week we'd have a rating of 0.3. Well, why was that? Because three people didn't watch because there's like, you know, 500 houses in Clark County that dictate the rating. So if three people don't watch, it really affects the rating. So you don't really know the numbers. They only could tell you the numbers like on Peacock because they can give you every number on that, and that's the one number we never hear of. Yeah, and they did mention in that stockholders call that all the pay-per-views, well, now they're premium live events. I guess we're going to have to start saying that. Uh, you know, we're up like 15, 25% of viewership on on Peacock. Oh, I bet they are because you no yeah. longer have to pay for it. Yeah, they, right. Yeah. How much money were they making at 50 bucks a pop? You know, WrestleMania was doing over a million buys, 50 million. Yeah, it's it you know, times change, that's for sure. But, and they don't use they don't even have that paper again, the pay-per-view was the gravy. Now the pay-per-view isn't a pay-per-view anymore. And they're still making that kind of money. So it just shows you it's just the TV deals and, and the sponsors and and all that is where they're making their money from. And Yeah, I mean, you be- know. between the Peacock contract and the Saudi Arabia contract, and WWE is going to be in the black every year. Well, and the TV contracts, too, obviously. They got, what, a billion from Fox? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. Right. So they they don't need to run a show, but they need to have the content, you know. And it does, AEW's it, got 700 shows, and are they making money off any of them? And AEW has to be good. WWE doesn't. Because if AEW is bad, people will stop watching. If WWE is bad, it doesn't matter because they're still making the money. They're getting, you know, they're, they come from the womb, those kids, that they're geared to watch WWE no matter what. You know, you can still ask people today, uh, you go on... Go 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 watch uh, go to go to a place that's airing the pay per view. Go to anything that's WWE and bring up other companies. More than half of those people have no knowledge of Ring of Honor, Impact, a- even AEW. You know, maybe more people know of AEW, but there's so many people who don't. Yeah, that, that's a great that, point, and that's why Impact was so thrilled to get Mickey James in the Royal Rumble because then the WWE mentions Impact Wrestling. So all of a sudden, now people who may not have ever heard of it now have an idea and at least know that it exists. Yeah, I heard they had 32 more viewers last week. So <laughs> See? That. And, that, and that's like five rating points. <laughs> well, yeah, Nick Aldis was one of them, so other than that. <laughs> oh, man. That's cruel. That is cruel. But, yeah, it's you know, it's the business side of, of, this, of these companies is quite interesting. And, you know, to see them, you know, that, that was their most profitable year they've ever had. By a mile, so Nick Khan's doing something right there, and that's and, all, and to be honest with you, at this point, that's all Vinnie Mac cares about is the bottom line. You show me the bottom line, and if it's the most profitable year I've ever had, then we're doing something right. We can continue to cut wrestlers, continue to have crappy shows because right. it doesn't just, matter. They're going to look at that and say, "Hey, you know what? Instead of 180 million last time, we made 140 million. We got rid of all these people. Hey, let's get rid of some more people. We'll make 210 million. Well, and that's part of the the reason that I think they all just consolidate and not have you know, multiple champions and things like that, because, you know, they, the roster is a little, a little thin, but if you take it down to where you've got one champion, men's and women's, and, you know, don't have the brand split and just, you know, because they've already been switching people since the draft. 
like crazy. So the brand split doesn't mean anything. You could actually it never con- meant anything. You can consolidate that part of it down too, and not need as many people to put on a to put on a show. Yeah, it might be a little more running around for everybody, but otherwise, that's a you know, it, it's one way. If they want to save some more money, they they could you know consolidate everything and do that, and you know, it might not be a bad idea. The the roster is so bloated to begin with. It's like you know. There's guys that are performing the same roles, except you're paying two of them. You know, you can go look on Raw and you see the basic enhancement guys that, you know, every once in a while get a push. And then you go to SmackDown. Well, why couldn't those guys do the same role? And now you took 40 of those guys and now there's 20 of them. Well, you know, when those guys are making two, 300,000 a year, you know, cutting 20, 30 guys. Uh, really adds up. Yep. Yeah, Cesaro has become one of those guys. Oh, poor Cesaro. Yeah. Didn't even get in the room. You know, he'll get up and down and he'll get a push. And then they'll wonder why he's not as over as he used to be. It's because he's perceived, as I like to say, your your perception of the wrestler is he's a loser. Happy Corbin is perceived as a loser. Same thing with Moss. So it's going to take a lot to turn that around and just giving them some wins against, you know, laying out Drew Drew McIntyre. Well, if they beat Drew McIntyre, that would destroy Drew McIntyre. It wouldn't help Happy Corbin. Right. People would be like, oh, he's, you know, he's a bum now, like Cesaro. Like, you know, he gets put in stuff, he's in with Sheamus, and then all of a sudden he's rotated out of, you know, a, a, a good spot. And that's what happens because there's too many guys. So now there's not room. You know, like when I talk about my shows, I have eight or nine guys that are going to win matches. And regardless that 15 guys need to win, there's still only nine wins. And, you know, all you can hope for is that the guy who has to lose does so in a manner where people like, wow, this guy's really good or, you know, Look, look at the guys I bring in, for example. I brought in some, like, really, really major talent that comes in, but a T.J. Perkins, for example. I'm not sure that T.J. Perkins has won any matches in FSW. Well, why is that? Well, uh, he's wrestling Matt Vandegrift at the anniversary show, and Matt is this I'm a coming superstar that should get signed sometime soon. He had a great match with Chris Bay, and... TJ put him over. And then we just had a match with Hammerstone and Cage and TJ, who had to take the spot because Davey Richards was unable to come because of the travel. And he took the he took the submission loss. And as good as he is, he should be getting a lot of wins. But because he's he's in randomly, it's hard for him to get a win because you don't know when you're going to use them again. I will say this. The crowd was very hot for T.J. Perkins on Friday night. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. That was one of the most uh, weirdest things I've ever seen. Like, T.J. comes in, and I always say about T.J., one of the best workers in the world. But he's not that guy because you never see him cut a promo, the personality. But he'll go out there and give you the best match on the card. And it was great to see that the fans, you know, showing – a lot of respect because I did notice we did have a lot of a lot of newer faces there on Friday. So yeah, and you know, and I was kind of kind of going to kind of lead into that with you know WWE cutting people because one person that got or two people that got cut from WWE made their returns to the ring at Mecca, and that's why I was saying I think a little history might be made because a new run for Killer Cross and Scarlet, and, and I, I've got to tell and, you, Joe. The, oh. One of the greatest spots I've ever seen in my life was Scarlett giving the code red to Jacob Fatu. Yes, yeah, so I was sitting down and I'm like, man, I'm sure paying her a lot of money. What is she going to do? Huh? And it was like, oh, oh, then she pulled that out. I'm like, oh, okay. All that money I paid was worth it. That was the, I, 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 <laughs> it happened. I was like, there's no way that just happened. And I was, for the rest of the night, I was talking, that was the only spot I was talking about. Cross, so at this event, uh, mm-hmm. That Joe held uh, a, a main event match in a lot of places. Killer Cross taking on uh, Jacob Fautu, who just had recently lost the MLW title to Hammerstone in a 
you know, a hugely hyped match. <laughs> and Cross and Fautu absolutely tore it down. And then Scarlet got up on the apron and was getting in, you know, on Jacob's case. And Jacob brought her into the ring and all of a sudden they're getting into it and Scarlet code reds him. I mean, and, and this is a, you know, and she's just you know, an average sized woman. I mean, not. Not like six there ain't nothing anything. average about her. Well, that is true. Um, but you know, for those who don't know, Red, I mean, she, she and Foul Two flipped, basically flipped over, and he got clobbered. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And and Cross after the match, by the way, you know, he's not one of those people that really likes to talk too much. But you know, he did got thank everybody and saying this, you know, this time was really tough for me and us, and we're, you know, but thank you for supporting us, and you know, we're looking forward to the future and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you know, I mean, where do you guys see Cross going after this? Because I, I know he's, you know, probably talking to AEW at this point. And if they don't, if they watch that match and see what Cross and Scarlet did together, and and Jacob Fowl too as well, because he's an amazing performer. Man, I would be shipping a contract over right now. So where where do you guys see Cross's future headed? Well, you know, obviously. I've seen like the Twitter stuff and things like that. And to me, he hasn't talked to me about any of it, but I see the teases as toward, you know, some AEW stuff, you know, and there's people there that, you know, matches that we would love to see that we're hoping that we can book. Like, uh, I'd love to see Cross and Malachi Black go at it. Yes. You know, oh. To me, that would be, you know, uh, as hard hitting. But just watching in little old silver nugget 500 people how over the dynamic of scarlet and cross was to see how wwe and how successful it was in nxt to just strip it on raw like why would you even want to do that is it the process to be like let's figure out the best way to get this guy over oh wait i know let's take out scarlet like who in the in the what? office would put that idea out there and then get okayed for that idea to be, yeah, let's let's run him or let's give him a losing streak and then he brings in Scarlett. Well, we, like, I mean, we just discussed it. it that, that's the problem is the process is let's just make money. I don't care who wins, who loses. I don't care if we're building. It's not WWE isn't about building people anymore. It's about let's just make money, and that's what they're doing. Well, I think that was part of Vince's, the, the, the tip of the iceberg with Vince, not liking the direction of NXT and wanting to change it all up. And, you know, he cleared out a lot of people there, not just wrestlers, but staff as well. William Regal, Triple H. And, and right. Cross, but, but Cross was their guy. There's and, a big difference to me. When you look at Cross, you look at him, you see his mannerisms, you see the way he cuts promos. That should be like a guy on top of Vince's list. Yeah, There's you would have thought. Six foot four. 260 pounds, phenomenal shape, but most importantly, he's got a great character, and he can cut a promo, and you can legitimately watch a video on Cross and be worried if you saw him in the back of an alleyway. You know, to me, he was like, not that he had gotten that level yet, but if Vince McMahon loved a Batista, how could he, how, he loved Batista because he was this big dude. Like, how do you not love a cross who's a big dude, but he has all the other attributes like promo skills and character mm -hmm. and everything? Like, we really thought that, you know, cross was on the fast track to become legitimately the WWE heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, I, and right, I, rightfully, I, he should have been. And I, and I agree with that. That's one of one of a couple missed main events that WWE is blown. You know, I I was still big on Undisputed Era coming up and taking on the Bloodline, uh, Cross and Scarlet doing the same thing, and you know, with this the the gimmick that they had set up in NXT. Keith oh Lee was another one who now is, by, by the way well, about to sign with AEW. You know, and Keith, you know, Keith Lee gets this massive push right away, but Cross gets buried, and it, and I just. Mm. It, it made it made no but sense. To I, I want to go back to Mecca real quick because there were a couple things I wanted to talk about. First of all, the tag team match, the four way tag team match that you had, or three way tag team match. Sorry, that the team that Shogun team was absolutely incredible. And let me tell you something. You know that's the thing with them. They are very raw as a tag team. They are very very 
uh, inexperienced as a tag team. Shogun's been around a little bit longer than Hero. Uh, Hero early on blew out his ACL, so it cost him, you know, 16 months or whatever. But these guys are good friends. They train together. They got everything it takes to be the heavy to, to be the tag champs. All they need is the reps. They're just, you know, if if you liked what you saw from them, that's from guys that have barely been together for a few months. That they're just honing their craft as a tag team. But it's obvious from the reaction of the crowd. They got the they got the look. They got the size. They got they got the athleticism. It's just getting them the the, the reps, and I think they have a shot to you know be a big time tag team. I didn't I, e- I didn't even mind the five person pile up. No, that, and that, that spot those, that, yeah, that spot like, fest that was worked. great actually. It really did. That worked. And the other question I had is and I don't know if you could speak this or not, in the main event, it looked like Brian Cage legitimately got hurt. I don't believe so cuz I would, you know, again, with all the running around, I'm only getting to see bits and pieces of the show, you know. And I talked to Cage immediately after, okay. you know, he he was fine at okay. that point. And you talk about the cross, Jacob Fatu, that was the main event. Unfortunately, uh, I guess Scarlett booked like three different flights because there was so much going on because they were going to work uh, in New Jersey the next day. And oh, okay. flights were being canceled all over the place, and they needed to get there because I guess they were a very important part of that show. She even wrestled on that show. So they ended up having to get to an eleven fifteen flight. So we actually had to move them up to, you know, two matches. Okay, that makes sense. Know, so now. they can get there in time. Got uh, it. Also, very impressed with that intergender match, which was absolutely, which, which was far better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, Funny Bone. You know, you you if you want to talk about Las Vegas local legends who've never made it to say the big time. You had the guy in the first match, Remy Marcel, who wrestled Willie Mack. Which is a great uh, match also. You know, Remy was in our Battle Royal in 2009 in the very first event we did, as was Cutthroat Cody, who uh, has really transformed himself. And Funny Bone was a third. He had broke his collarbone earlier on in that show, but he actually helped Kenny King win the heavyweight championship at our very first event. So those are the three local... You know, 10 years, 15 years in, you know, local Vegas legends that we mixed in with the great talent from outside. And then, uh, you know, some of our homegrown talent, as you said, you know, Sandra Moon, who wrestled Funny Bone, who's our women's champions. She she literally started in our kids class at like 15 years old. Yeah, she 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 did a fantastic job in that match. She did. She did. And. Yeah, you know, and of course, Kenny King looked great. Yes, he did. He always looks great, though. Yeah, I'll tell you what, he stepped it up. I said, oh, the old man had to hang with the young kids. Yeah, he was in there with a bunch of the youngsters. So. Will, uh, even yeah. Willie Mack looked great. Yeah, Willie Mack was uh, great. Willie Mack always looked great. Yeah, but Kenny King was supposed to wrestle Sam Adonis. And Sam Adonis, who's big in AAA and in the lucha scene, great dude. He's actually Corey Graves' brother. And... Uh, Sam couldn't make it also because of uh, the flight issues with the snowstorms on the East Coast. So I moved TJ into the three-way with Hammerstone and Cage because I felt him and Davey Richards have a similar shooty kind of wrestling style that right. would be a good dynamic. And then with Kenny needing a match, you know, a guy we brought in, like, oh, I was, you know, it was odd to a lot of people bringing in, you know, a hot young guy, talent out of the East Coast, Casey Navarro who's not really a regular at FSW because, you know, he was an AEW dark guy. Now he's signed with MLW, but we have a good relationship with him and he's an awesome dude. So he got to wrestle with Jay Vidal and Damian Drake, two of our homegrown talents and adding Kenny to the mix made it a great dynamic because we had three guys that were looking to soar. And then you had Kenny King who is, is more grounded. And I thought that might've been, to me that, because again, I didn't see everything. I didn't really see a lot of Bay and Vandergriff. But to me, what I watched of the four way was the match of the night. Well, we got about a minute, and I did want to make sure we mentioned Vandergriff because what I amazing thought match he that was and too. Chris yeah. Bay were they great. tore it up, and and Vandergriff is someone that you know you mentioned it earlier that that guy is going places. That was my most, he to is, me. He to, was he was unbelievable. I thought Bay was winning that match, I and see, to see Vandergriff win that match to me was the the, the most incredible well, win he lost, of the no, night. No, he, he lost it. I thought Vandergriff won that match. No. Bay, Bay hit that, caught him. No, he went for the four fifty, and and, uh, and Bay, Bay hit him with the cutter. cutter. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. 
But Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of great people to watch from FSW. Just an and incredible beyond. event, though. You did yeah. a fantastic job, Joe. So we're going to be you, back. Joe. We're going to be back with more. We got a bonus half hour. Fish has got to take off. So it'll be uh, myself and Joe DeFalco talking a little EW. MJF going over on the punk in Chicago. I thought we were going to talk about fish. Okay, forget it. No, forget fish. He's gone. Stick around, everybody. We've got a half hour more of the Mark Oak Show on KDWN. 101.5 FM, 720 AM. Thank you for joining us on the Mark Oak Show. One five FM, seven twenty AM. K Don, the talk of Las Vegas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the number one professional wrestling radio show in Las Vegas. This is the Mark Hoke Show. The Mark Hoke Show. One full hour of wrestling news, entertainment, and lots of Sin City surprises from inside the squared circle. Now, let's bring on the tag team of Andrew Fish Fame, Joe DeFalco, and your host, Mark Hoke. I'm sorry we lied in the intro. It's 90 yeah, minutes. I thinking that, yes. 90 minutes. We get bonus time because they love us so much here at KDWN. It's pretty darn exciting. Thanks for joining us hey, on the Mark so you know, If you can hit up HR, I'm still waiting for the check from those extra 30 minutes the last couple of weeks. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll send you the bill for advertising for your event. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's all good. Joe DeFalco hanging around. Fish had to take off. Uh, but uh, Joe DeFalco sticking around here as we give you the best in pro wrestling news and entertainment. We've got another half hour of all sorts of excitement coming up to you if you're a wrestling fan. Well, even if you're not, listen to the show because we always have a blast on here. Oh, man. AEW. Holy cow. They finally listen to me. Yeah. How about that? The big match this week in AEW featured our, well, probably the top up and coming heel in professional wrestling, MJF, Maxwell, Jacob Friedman taking on the legend CM Punk in his hometown of Chicago and not only beats him once, but beats him twice after the match was restarted. So MJF goes over on CM Punk in a wild scene in Chicago. How about that, Joe? MJF getting the win. Well, that would mean he should be now catapulted to the... uh top of the food chain and should be challenging uh, hangman page pretty soon yeah i yeah i i totally agree with that um the match itself i thought was very well done um mjf and punk you know just really beat the crud out of each other and you know but a smartly wrestled match i uh, i mean i have nothing bad to say about it and of course there was a restart in there uh, mjf had choked punk out but he had a had some tape that he had under his arm which i thought was a pretty cool little finish uh but then the referee saw that he had the tape after uh after the match he had called for the submission and they restarted the match but then you know we had a little outside interference and the mgf punched mr punk with the diamond ring that he has and that took care of it. So, you know, I mean, when they did that restart, I was thinking, well, what are they going to pull here? But MJF gets gets the win, and right. the young and guy goes over. usually happens in those situations. So it's, it, it's good to see they did what they were supposed to do, but they kind of just did it in a way where people now were like, oh, uh, okay. You know, it's kind of like when we see these Bobby Lashley false finishes with uh, Lesnar to where, you know, we need to make that look that way. That's why, you know, but Lesnar won, you know, and then they had it taken away. So usually when that situation occurs, oh, there's a restart, you know, the other guy's usually going to go over. Right. And, you know, they did the right thing and and put the right guy over in that situation. Now, 
you know, they need to now see what they do next. That's the most important thing. Right. You know, you can't have him beat CM Punk, and then next week he's wrestling, you know, Dante Martin. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you need to put him in. You know, now he's beaten the prodigal son who's returned. You know, I've proven to my, I've proven to everyone that I'm deserving of being the champion. You know, I'm, I just beat, you know, the best in the world or whatever his moniker is compared to Brian Danielson's, you know, and it's like now, now's the time, you know, it's a hot time for him. You know, everybody knows he's about ready. And it's like, you know, I always talk about, you know, putting the title on somebody or taking the title off. I'd rather take the title off somebody a little early than a little late. Yeah, and, that, that totally makes sense. You know, now's the time to jump on the MJF thing because he's proven time and time again he'll carry any feud just with his mic work. Yeah, I don't. I honestly don't want to see a rematch right now. I think that would be a bad idea. I think that's something that they can hold for down the road, and especially if they, you know, do put the belt on MJF. Well, now you have Punk eventually working his way up, you know, having to fight his way back to get to MJF. And getting that rematch for the AEW title, which you know, was was something that I was hoping they were going to do, and you know they may be following through on that. I I think that's the play. Well, it should be the play. So, but again, where do they want to go? You know, we thought that they were going to end up pulling the trigger and you know taking the belt off Page. Well, if they can have Page beat Danielson, they can sure have uh, MJF. Right there in the mix. Well, and one thing that I think is really distinctive about AEW right now, as opposed to what WWE is doing, if you look at the, the all the guys that they brought in, you know, Adam Cole just lost to Orange Cassidy in the AEW original. You have uh, Paige holding on to the world title against Brian Danielson. Uh, Jade Cargill, uh, you know, someone who's brand new to wrestling. But, you know, has been put over as the TBS champ. Britt Baker, homegrown women's champ. You have Sammy Guevara, young guy, just beat uh, Cody Rhodes and, uh, oh, and I'm forgetting who else it was. Uh, well, beat Cody Rhodes for the whole on to that TNT title. You, and you just had Ricky Starks beat Jay Lethal as well. So, you know, AEW, I think, is doing a really good job of sticking with building some of their younger guys, sticking with the people that were there with them from the start, as opposed to the, what could have been, you know, Adam Cole comes in and is just destroying everybody. Brian Danielson comes in and wins the belt. Uh, Jay Lethal could have beaten Ricky Starks last night and so on. I, I think it's a fascinating thing because WWE has not done a good job with bringing up their young stars. They've just stuck with Reigns and Lesnar and a couple other people. So it's, I think it's a terrific dynamic in AEW that I think the people that are there have got to be feeling good to say, you know what, we've got a shot. Even if we're young, we've still got a shot. If we wrestle well, we're going to, we can be on top of this thing for now. Well, yeah, you know, the thing is, though, a guy like Ricky Starks has been being pushed for months. So, you know, it isn't like bringing up Braun Breaker tomorrow. Well, the the main fans aren't going to really know who he is, and they're not going to put Braun Breaker in a feud, and he's going to beat Bobby Lashley. If he does, it would be criminal. Yes. Uh, but, you know, the guys that you had mentioned, the MJF, the Ricky Starks, even Jungle Boy. Yeah, Jungle Boy uh, Luke 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 Soros. Soros, You know, they've been put in good situations. They've beaten some of their best, and they're utilizing a Jay Lethal, who I love Jay Lethal personally and professionally, you know, but He's the guy who just came to the company, and he's his worth is trying to turn Ricky Starks from a marginally good talent into a superstar because Ricky Starks now beat a guy that a lot of people think is one of the best best in the world. And a great finish on that, by the way, if you didn't see it. I did not. He countered, he, he countered the lethal injection into his finish and, and decked Jay Lethal. It was something. A beautiful move. Beautiful. So, so Ricky Starks got a got a nice rub there. Yeah, and Ricky Starks is a guy. He was. I, I remember a couple of years ago. You know, he was in the NWA, and 
somebody somebody had actually hit me up about him, you know, and it was like, okay, but then, you know, everything happened and the pandemic and all this other stuff. But and then I knew NWA was kind of like not really doing a lot during the pandemic. And he asked for his release. And I was thinking, wow, that's kind of weird because NWA was literally still paying people to not wrestle. And it was like he took, you know, he took a shot on himself. Uh, and again, who knows? Maybe he talked to AEW beforehand. That's why he asked for the release. But best move he ever made. You know, he was a guy who just started getting noticed on NWA to NWA television. And then he went in and got put in with the uh, Taz's group. They kind of took Cage out and all of a sudden, good to go. And now Ricky Starks is now considered, you know, a top talent. And, you know, he's good on the mic. Yes, he is. He's in a good situation. And that that's what what's about the wrestling business man it's like you got to create stars you got to create people that people want to see and wwe has done an atrocious job of it because there's nobody that you know other than that's why you know people talk about it but that's why they have to bring back you know all the old timers because that's the only one the fans really care about you know have they done a great job with Roman Reigns? Sure. Seth Rollins. Yep. Kevin Owens. But it's like they're so far and few in between. Drew McIntyre. But, you know, unfortunately, as we said, when we were discussing about the Rumble, you know, there was literally 10 guys in at one time that you're like, this guy isn't even, you know, capable of winning the United States title, let alone the heavyweight title. Yeah, and the, and the trick that WWE has to handle here is they are getting told, I want this wrestler on this show by Fox. And USA is like, well, I want to get this person on, on Raw. And you know they're, they're running into issues with how they're doing things being dictated by the networks as opposed to doing what they should be doing, even though I don't know if they, they would if they, they had the freedom to do it. Well, you know, the bottom line is if somebody in Fox loves Cesaro, he'd be the champ. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because Vince is going to appease, just like in Saudi Arabia. You know, Goldberg goes there and generally wins. You know, they bring in, you know, Shawn Michaels did a match. The Undertaker did a match. You know, all the power in the world to a Steve Austin who didn't do a match, you know, they, like he would have been paid millions, oh, literally. If he could if do he, one. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's what it is at the bottom line with the money. Vince McMahon will do whatever is necessary. He'll put a belt on Goldberg and have him beat the hottest guy in the company, Bray Wyatt, because they need him in Saudi Arabia. Well, and, and speaking of that card in Saudi Arabia, the, this is looking so predictable at this point with the Elimination Chamber coming up. Um, the matches right now, it's Drew McIntyre against Madcap Moss, Reigns against Goldberg, uh, uh, Uso against Uso's against the Viking Raiders, uh, Becky Lynch and Lita, and then Bobby Lashley defending in that uh, match we mentioned earlier with Lesnar, Rollins, Theory, Riddle, and AJ Styles in the Elimination Chamber. Dude, this is so... I don't know... This there, there's no excitement to this card to me whatsoever. None. No, because all it is it's a, it's a money grab card. You know, the Usos and the Viking Raiders is you know not even a main event of SmackDown. You know, that's just a regular match. You know, and again, I'm looking at it. Uh, is there more matches, or is there only been so far five announced? Uh, five announced. Those, those are those five. So. Right, so, you know, they'll probably have the Garbage Battle Royal get more people on there, you know, in that situation. But, Wait, waiting for yeah. Mansoor as well. Got to get no, Mansoor. Nobody, nobody, yeah, of course. Nobody's <laughs> been excited. Yeah, Mustafa Ali is going to make a comeback. <laughs> that poor guy. He's going to be the face of Saudi Arabia for WWE. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this is almost, this is almost looking like a skip card, you know, except for you know, to see where the main event actually ends up going. Yeah, uh, the Elimination Chamber is the only match that most people, again, Drew McIntyre, Mad Cat Moss, I'm pretty sure we've seen that on SmackDown already. I you think know what I mean? Have. 
Yeah, I, I'm not excited about this at That's all. That's how you're pushing Drew to get back into the title picture? Yeah, I, I I don't know what they're doing with Drew. You know, I, I feel so bad for the guy because he carried the company through the pandemic when there were no fans in the stands. And he went from being beating Brock Lesnar to at SummerSlam wrestling Jinder Mahal. And I can I was there and I can tell you that no one cared about that match whatsoever. Drew barely got it got cheered in that whole thing. It was sad. And now he's yeah, wrestling you know, now, now he's wrestling Madcap Moss. Yeah, and, they, you know, I think they were thinking that, you know, the history, because, you know, they were such a successful group, uh, 3MB, that it'd be like, <laughs> whoa, you know, it's almost like they reunited the Shield. Oh, I miss Heath Slater. Let's get him back. Yeah. yeah I guess he's doing all right in Impact. Yeah, well, he's hanging in there. He's got a job. He's feeding his he's kids. Got a, he's got a job. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so some interesting times in WWE. You know, one one guy that I wanted to, since we have a little time, I wanted to talk about. Uh, some people are probably wondering if they watched AEW. That the the entity, I guess, is the best way to call it, known as Danhausen, showed up, popped out from under the ring a couple weeks ago, and said hi to Adam Cole, and I think he cursed him. Uh, for those that haven't seen Danhausen. How would you how would you describe Danhausen? You know, we were actually in contact with Danhausen on a few occasions. He's out of like Wisconsin, I believe, but he's in Canada a lot. And we were trying to get him actually I thought a great match would have been Danhausen and Funny Bone. Oh my god, know? yeah. And Danhausen is this guy. I remember watching him on Ring of Honor. I'm like, who is this dude? And the crowd was going like insane for this guy. And that was before I realized the Danhausen phenomenon that has really taken off. And, you know, he's this, you know, weird character that has really, on the indie scene, uh, you know, he's a guy that is beloved by the, th- by, the cr- by the fans. So I think AEW scooping him up. Smart move. You know, he, he, here's a guy with the buzz. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the buzz. You know, a lot of times there's the WWE fans who won't watch the indie stuff, and then there's the indie fans who refuse to watch the big-time stuff. But you can't not watch the big-time stuff if you're fans of the indie stuff because, like, AEW is signing those guys, you know? So it almost forces you to watch. If you like Danhausen, you're not really going to see him that often if you're an indie fan unless you're buying, like, a Fight TV pay-per-view. So now you're going to get to see him on regular TV every week. You know, that's a win-win. Now, again, where does he fit in, you know, once he does a couple things, you know? But being that, that, that type of character that he is, an oddity, you know, dark carnival character or whatever, you know, it's a fresh face. You know, that's the thing. That, the main problem I have is I was talking with Remy Marcel yesterday, and we were talking about, the continuity and trying to keep things creative. And it's really difficult because guys, guys have now been part of FSW. A lot of guys, six, seven, eight years. And how do you keep freshness? Mm -hmm. How do you make people be engaged in things when you're seeing the same people over and over? And that's WWE's main problem. While AEW is a little fresher because they've only been on TV. So there's a lot of matches that haven't been seen yet. So there's a lot of matches that people would be interested in that not necessarily dream matches, just stuff that they haven't seen a hundred times. Right. You go to and WWE and you just have to, you have to continually rehash because you got two, three shows a week. You got the pay-per-view, you know, and it's like those, those feuds have never ended just because it's too many of the same guys. When the big show's there and he's been changed a thousand times because what do you do? Back in the day, Andre the Giant would just leave for six months and go to Japan. He'd go to, right, yeah. you know, Bill Watts, and they, they would have all these territories. And that was the advantage of the territories. You can forget about somebody, bring them back, repackage. Now you're still on the roster, and all you can do is take them off TV for two or three months. Yeah, and, and Dan Housen is certainly going to be it, – it's going to be interesting to see how they make him fit. Because, you know, and, and Dan Housen is a solid wrestler, but, you know, he's – the. You know, he's got the white face paint and he says he's 700 years old and, you know, he curses people uh, in the in the ring and all sorts of crazy stuff. And if you haven't seen Danhausen, just 
geez, just type it in on YouTube. You'll see plenty of Dan Housen, that's for sure. But it, you know, you know, it's kind of it, like Orange Cassidy. You know, some people hate the gimmick, and some people love it. Yeah, and and Dan Housen, you know, has popped up here and there, said hi to everybody, and you know, he's got the the weird speech and so on. I I think I think he's a good guy for AEW because he can prov- he can provide that comic relief without it being really cheesy. You know what I mean? And forced. yeah, I think him and Lance Archer should have a feud. Well, he did. They, they did a little uh, skit a, oh, did a they? couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, Dan yeah, Housen bumped We're into on the same page at AEW. They're making some smart moves. Yeah, they he bumped into a locker room. Um, so the Dan Housen phenomenon heads to AEW, which I you know we'll we'll see how that turns out. I think it's going to be a lot of fun for sure. So. You know, a lot of personality there. You know, they got a lot of good workers that are just good workers. There's a lot of good young talent, but you can't tell them apart because they don't talk. We don't know if they can talk. You know, it, it's hard to bring in some fresh talent that has never been seen before, but they're able to engage on a microphone, and we try to push that as much as the wrestling. I've always said a a good wrestler who can can talk on the microphone and, and have a character is a world champion. A great wrestler who's got no personality whatsoever is Brad Armstrong. <laughs> That is, you know, that is a perfect analogy. Of course, the Armstrong family, legendary in professional wrestling. Right, and as great as he is as a wrestler, it didn't matter because he couldn't engage the crowd. You know, John Cena was never the greatest wrestler of all time. The Rock became a really good wrestler, but that's not why he was put in the position he was. Yeah, I mean, the one Armstrong that stood out was Brian, of course, Road Dog. So. Right, and he wasn't a, that great a worker, no, but he, he was wasn't. able to engage the crowd. Billy Gunn was the worker of the group. Yep. Yeah, because he, he couldn't cut a promo, and that's why they put him together. And then when they tried to put Billy Gunn as a single against The Rock, The Rock just demolished him on the microphone. And instead of having a feud, I remember the pay-per-view, you know, The Rock went over clean, and Billy Gunn went right back to the New Age Outlaws because he couldn't carry, you know, a feud, especially as a babyface which is what's needed. That's why John Cena was the man. Like, John Cena was the rapper. And now look at John Cena. He's in every every freaking commercial. Yeah, and doing a good job on Peacemaker, by the way. Oh, I love that show. Oh, man. That is Hilarious. some funny stuff. It's it's cool to see John Cena doing so well there. Uh, let's see. And uh, so we got about three minutes to go, and I'm just trying to find see if i got one more story here. Well, you want to talk a little bit about AEW on uh, Maserati, oh. Jordan Cruz, oh, that's and right. I wanted to give Leona, you that match all got that. to appear. Yeah, I that that was then that was where I was headed. Yeah, you get you got a lot of people that came out of FSW that are uh, making their debuts on AEW Dark and kind of working their way up. I did see Maserati did get to I believe she lost her match, but that's okay. Yeah, they all do, but the you know the, the the thing was they they actually you know didn't just bring her in and just totally job her out. They actually let her you know show off what she is capable of doing, and hopefully you know that's the start of other things. Because in AEW, they use a lot of women on, it, especially on AEW Dark. So yes. they they've cycled in hundreds of them, but they're also looking to sign women wrestlers. Maserati kind of got screwed over because it, she was part of the, the Ring of Honor women's tournament and it looked like there was a good chance that she was going to get signed. And then uh, obviously we saw what happened with ROH. They kind of stopped running and stopped all the contracts. So she never got offered one. So, you know, all that hard work, it's kind of disappointing because you're thinking, okay, here's here's my chance for that for the big time. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, sorry. Sorry, honey. Uh, we're going to close up shop for a while. Well, and one thing that I think is really great about AEW is you don't see that many squash matches. You know, that's a match that just, you know, one person gets destroyed in a couple of minutes. They do a really good job, even if somebody loses a match, to try and make them look good. Uh, you know, if they're a mid carter or a rookie, whatever, they do everything they can to not bury their talent that's coming up. And, you know, unlike WWE that just finds ways to destroy people at every turn. So you Yeah, know. you know, at least back in the day it was enhancement guys. It's actually now regular roster guys that you're paying money to go in and get squashed. Yep. It's like, well then why do you 
And again, great that these guys have jobs and stuff, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot more wrestling jobs in major companies this day where people can actually make a living in professional wrestling than they could after the dead times after WCW and ECW kind of folded. All right. Well, hey, Joe, we got to wrap it up. Joe DeFalco, Future Stars Wrestling. Go to FSW Vegas. Check out all their shows at the Training Academy. Follow us on Twitter at Mark Hoke Show. Facebook, The Mark Hoke Show. MarkHokeShow.com. Download those podcasts. Iran, join the party. Iran, number one. Yeah, we got 12 uh, different countries ordered the uh, pay-per-view this week. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So thanks for joining us on The Mark Hoke Show. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day, Las Vegas.